Thank you very much. I'll turn this oh, I need both. Yeah. I'm yeah. rather wired, and so it makes you sort of flow. Oh. <laughs> I've got one, one so that um, I can be heard by Joanne, and one to be heard by you. So it's going to just take me a minute to get used to that. Um, thank you very much, Brenda. I'm going to introduce you to the other people that are on the panel just briefly now, and then we'll be calling upon them later. But um, the first, the girls to my right, are first of all Yvonne Doucette and Kelly Schoenfeld, and they both, um, uh, Kelly works at Cottonwoods all the time and Yvonne works at Cottonwoods intermittently and in other care facilities in the city with seniors. And then Jordan Bennett, uh, who is a young artist who just came here this past um, fall, he's doing his masters at UBCO, and um, he'll be telling you about, uh, about his experience with Daphne. Um, I seem to be not well technically tonight, and what I thought was going to be a paper and I wanted to read from has ended up being my computer with the failed ink. So I'm going to sit down and continue that way if that's all right with you. As Brenda's mentioned, advocating for, the, for creative aging has been my passion. When I first met Daphne, almost 12 years ago, I was captivated by her and excited to tell her story. Previously, I had written a book on another senior Canadian artist who planted in me a determination to do what I can to preserve the stories of senior artists. I think we do a lot to preserve their works, but sometimes not quite as much to preserve their stories. They are our cultural heritage. We are our stories. After meeting Daphne, I kept in touch intermittently through the next decade. Now, since her move to Cottonwoods in the spring of 2013, I visit almost daily when I'm in the city. She loves to chat, she loves to joke a lot, and she loves to laugh, and she likes to reminisce and I like listening to all of it. Um, from her, I'm learning how we can better treat seniors and our future selves. There is a serious need for change. If any of you have visited a care facility, you understand what I'm saying. 
Since the fall of 2011, I have edited an online journal that, as Brenda mentioned, and I have um, two copies on the table over there of one issue that I did when I hosted a 94th birthday party for Daphne, and it tells her story. And then another that I did this past spring, just before the Creative Aging Day on June 20th, and it's called All Alone and Having Fun. And let me tell you, she's one of the few in all the hundreds at Cottonwoods that is having fun. Um, the more I got to know Daphne, the more I realized she embodies uh, all that I really intend to have people learn through the journal, which is called Saging with Creative Spirit, Grace, and Gratitude. The more, as I say, the more I get to know her, the more I realize that's what she does. The journal urges us to know ourselves, be, know yourself, be yourself, love yourself, and share yourself. I believe these are the ingredients for what Abraham Maslow, um, in his list of the human hierarchy of needs, calls actualization. And that's part of what I want to point out to you tonight when I'm talking about Daphne. It is the highest need for every one of us. Um, Maslow describes it as the desire for self-fulfillment, the need to become more and more of what one essentially is, not what others have asked us to be, not what we have imagined we should be because we look at the culture around us, but rather who we really are, to become everything that one is capable of becoming is what Maslow urges us to do. And what I suggest Daphne does. Daphne calls this her soul speaking. Our care facilities are looking after the patient's physical needs, but many souls are suffering. Since she was a young girl, Daphne has been open to her inner spirit and shared it through her art. Her intuitive way of being is what has made her unique as an artist. By nature, she has also understood she has a greater purpose and she has doggedly kept to the fulfillment of her dreams for herself and for others. When Daphne was 13, she got rheumatic fever and her mother took her out of our school system because she too had suffered with the same disease and believed that she had never healed properly because she wasn't given the time. She wanted to protect her daughter. Daphne's mother died at age 38 when Daphne was 15. Daphne held her in her arms as she died. These are the events that made a huge impact on who Daphne is and who her art is. The last year of formal schooling for Daphne was completed in grade seven. But throughout life, she has been given seven, I like the, the synchronicity of numbers, honorary PhDs. It says something, doesn't it, about our education system and what she chose or how she chose to educate herself. She did that with the help of her grandfather, Jonas. He was a stone carver, and she followed him watching and drawing on her own. She fell in love with the woods on Manitoulin Island and studied nature and its changing energy. She had loved school, and she continued to be an avid reader. Proudly, she recollects how she would run classrooms in the pig shed on family property. Again, lovely synchronicity. She did this so that she could teach the younger children to pay attention. Pay attention to everything and to love to learn. Those were the values that she cherished. Uh, she describes how a teacher came afterwards to say that her students, Daphne's students, were the, always the best in the classroom. And she told me that, repeated it just the other day. She's proud of it. And being a teacher is something that she always yearned to be. Thank you. And I think she's done it in a very subtle way. She's done it by being and being a role model for all of us. Excuse me. Um, these are the characteristics that Maslow ascribes to self-actualized people. 
they have realistic perceptions of themselves, others, and the world around them. Exactly what Daphne nurtured in herself. They are concerned with solving problems outside of themselves, including helping others and finding solutions to problems in the external world. Daphne saw a problem with the respect that her people were getting, and she set out to change that. Um, they are motivated by a sense of personal responsibility and ethics. They are spontaneous in their internal thoughts and outward behavior. Uh, when you get a chance to look at some of Daphne's most recent drawings, you'll see that spontaneity is definitely what guides her. While um, self-actualized people can conform to rules and social expectations, they also tend to be open and unconventional. They have a need for independence and privacy. And that's something that fortunately, when Daphne started at Cottonwood, she was in a room with four people. And it was difficult. She formed a great friendship with one of the women, but the other two were in very advanced stages of illness, and it was pretty tough. Then she was moved into a, a double room, and she made the best of that too. But now she's in a private room, and she gets that looks right out on the front door, and she knows everything that's going on in Cottonwoods and pays close attention to it all. Um, they tend to take the world with a continual sense of appreciation, wonder, and awe. Even simple experiences can continue to be a source of inspiration and pleasure. And if any of you take the opportunity to visit Daphne, which she will welcome, she, the door is always closed, uh, but it's always open in her heart. And so just you know, tap and, and go in. It's the first door on your right on what's called Sea Wing or Catter. Um, I'm going to turn to the slides now, and particularly the one that you've been looking at. This is Daphne at the opening night of this exhibition. Beautiful smile, isn't it? That is a few, about a month after turning 95. She turned 95 September the 11th. Um, she was alert, and she's always eager it's the sense of responsibility to be happy and show everybody that she's happy and glad to see them. She's much more worried about them and never thinks about her, about you, really, the people that come to see her, and never thinks about herself. Um, Kelly and I almost thought we were going to have her here tonight, and we were all full of hope, and then she decided that no, it really was better for us to talk she, she understood, and I thought this is a great sense of modesty, that if she came, it, because she doesn't go out much, it would distract from the message that we want to talk to you about. And it probably would have. And so she said, take movie. And so we are. Um, the next picture, whoa, I was afraid that was going to happen. I'm not quite sure why that scrambles, so I'm just going to ad lib here because these, uh, this, each time we put the stick in something, I seem to get a different order and I don't understand why. But what you're looking at here, are, uh, and interspersed with some photographs, are Daphne's drawings that she began in February of this year. Um, she, the, in February, I had been away for about a month, and when I came back, Every, I could see the nurses looking, because I had been there enough that everyone knew me. And then one started following me down the hall, so that by the time I got to the room, I thought, what is going on? And Daphne's there, beaming that, look, I've started to draw again. My soul had to speak, she said. And so these drawings are all done since last February, and there really are almost about 300 of them. It's amazing. This is all she does. This picture, some of you might recognize the other woman in the picture of Daphne. And um, when I would show Daphne the slides I was going to show yesterday, she said, well, you've got to take the one of Mikhail Jean. I went, OK. And so as well as having seven honorary PhDs, 
She also has the Governor General's Award for Visual Arts, the Order of BC, and the Order of Canada. And this is one of her early drawings. As you look at these drawings, I um, urge you to look at the spirit that's behind them. You'll see as I go through, uh, there's a spot where, well, a slide where you'll see how Daphne's drawing. But when she's asked to talk about these drawings, she goes, I said it all in the drawing. Can't you see it? And she genuinely sits there, and I, as I've heard her say this to so many people, and um, listen to what she's doing, I've begun to realize that she really absolutely becomes enlivened with the act of drawing and going into her own imagination. And that's really what I think the message of her work is. It um, Certainly, what she's done to bring recognition to First Nations and other artists in that group is, you know, it's made her a national legend. But what she does for herself is equally as important. And I think you'll see as we go through these, the humor, the curiosity. And she will always say, I never know what I'm going to draw. And mistakes, mistakes, they're the best because they take me in some new direction. That is Daphne on Mother's Day. I arrived. You'll note the purple spot in the front of her hair. Um, I included that in the journal story because she was delighted. And she had me put a purple streak in every day. It lasted for about a month, maybe six weeks. And then she decided that was enough. But um, some, another woman had come in to visit her on Mother's Day. And she had her 97-year-old mother with her. And she said, so. Now, this woman, now that we're all together, what about putting streaks in our hair? And so they, Daphne thought it was wonderful, and I arrived shortly after that, and she said, so, what do you think? And everyone in the Cottonwoods would notice her purple streak. This is when she talks about um, one of the drawings where she really talks about she's drawing energy. And she spent a period of time just loving the little squiggles that are up at the top and in many of these and all around the people. That's her, her sense. She, she says, don't you see that, don't you? That's the energy. Now, this is one that I thought was going to be at the very beginning. This one, and I hope the next one. Um, I'll just go forward and see. Yes, these two are her very first drawings. These are the two that she had when I came back from that uh, vacation in February. And she had not drawn for over a year at that point. She stopped drawing because her hands are badly arthritic. And I have a, a slide that will come up that shows you how she adjusted to that. And this is an example of the influence that Daphne could, be, could do. Um, and uh, this is done by her, the aide who followed me into the room that day, so anxiously waiting for me to find out, or for her to see how I felt when Daphne was drawing again. And she said, and I'm doing it too. And she grabbed this piece of paper off a table, and she said, see, I can do it. Anybody can do it. And, I, and that's the message. It's just we have to take the time to do it. We have to give ourselves permission to play and be kids again. I love that this piece of paper that she found literally just on, a, on someone's bedside table was pink because in energy that's the color of love. This was the hit of Cottonwoods. Daphne titled it, My Grandmother Smoking Pot. <laughs> now, the pot, where she got this idea is there is actually an MS patient who uh, regularly smokes pot all day long out in front of Cottonwoods, and she watches them go in and out and in and out. And I said, well, where did this, you know, with this idea, why your grandmother? And she said, well, it grew everywhere then. How do I know she wasn't smoking it? And I thought, it's true. How does she? Whoops. I missed that shows you what Daphne does to be able to get control of her pencil. It's a careful study. 
And she'll point out to people that, you know, I used to just paint. I didn't just uh, draw with colored pencils. But this is what she has. And, and just in the last month, she's decided there's a formula. And I'll show you her last drawings as, and or point out her last drawings as they come up. But her formula is she only uses four colors unless she gets confused, and that's a mistake that was intended to draw her in a better direction. Um, and, but she repeats every color five times, and she counts them out. Think about what that exercise is doing for her mind. She's, going, she's delving into the right side of her brain, brain, playing with her imagination, and now she's introduced a little left brain activity into the, into the mix. And I think she's teaching us what could certainly be done with seniors. Everybody can do, I call them Daphne doodles. Everybody could do them if they let themselves. And that's what we need to encourage, that, that freedom to just realize that drawing, creativity, is the gift that we were given. And it stays with us till our last days. It's the one thing that will stay with us. People that even have diseases of the autoimmune system, drawing is something that has stayed, that stays with them. Dementia patients often will, um, will often form a more interesting drawings as they move into dementia, and it's the one thing that will bring them to a point of calm. It's something we need to urge our senior facilities to have more of for the patients in their care. I'll go through these quickly. Just think of the fun, think the curiosity. Each one, ah, and this is my friend Rose Sexsmith, also now Daphne's friend, and she, Rose loves to laugh, Daphne loves to laugh, the two of them sit and laugh together, and Daphne was singing, started singing and humming, and she was singing the, drawing her trees, and got into singing the song, Blue Skies, Nothing But Blue Skies, from. And so Rose, but she didn't know any other line than that, I don't either. And um, so Rose said, well, let me get it on my phone for you. So the two of them sat there and sang, had a wonderful time. These are, this is one of Daphne's drawings as we're moving along. This is from the fall. You can see a difference. All of them more recently are moving into a bit more seriousness, um, and, and you'll see that. Except this is one that she did for my granddaughter. Um, it's, uh, I don't know why, uh, Abby came in and she was fascinated by what she calls crinkles on my face and on Daphne's. She's four, so she can talk about these things. Well, Daphne was just, uh, captivated by, and always, she says, so how's Crinkles doing? That's what Abby has become, her name is, she's become for Daphne. But for some reason, when um, Abby was here for her first birthday, she was most concerned with these Crinkles that I had and next, and she said, but I really do like turkeys. I'd like a turkey. So only the mind of a four-year-old and Daphne's can make that leap and decide, well, let's have a turkey. So this was the turkey she drew for Abby. It's fun. Abby loves it. This is just one of her creatures, but she points out he's having a great time. Maybe he's dancing. Winnie, is, sorry, ah. Daphne and her sister Winnie were great dancers. That's, as she said, that's just what we did. And um, she, Winnie died, she was Daphne's younger sister, and she died last May. And that was very upsetting to Daphne. She didn't, she never thought that Winnie would go before her. And so remembering the days dancing, she started adding that boot to her drawings, and it's her reminder of the days dancing. She did a big series of the trees and people, and I, I think that you could, it's easy to see the fond memories that she had from Manitoulin Island and the environment that she grew up in. I said earlier that her grandfather Jonas was really her teacher, in league with Daphne herself. 
And Jonas was a stone carver. He primarily carved tombstones. And um, Daphne was fascinated by watching. He would do intricate sketches for them. She watched that. And then he liked to carve out in the field. And so Daphne would sit in the trees and in the field. And that's when she, how she taught herself to draw. It, one of the um, most notable books, the one that she thinks is the best about her life, is Born with a Paintbrush in My Hand. And that, that's the way she sees that, that she learned and, learned and taught herself. And this is an adventure that she decided she needed to have last uh, summer. Obviously, she's going sailing. Uh, I couldn't believe it when, I, could you believe it when Kelly took her? <laughs> no. But there she is, she's in the boat, and she said, and I handled the tiller. I didn't keep it very straight, but I did it. That's what I see when I look through the window every day. When I arrive, either if I come in the morning, she's in her chair. If I come in the afternoon, she's in her bed, but she's always drawing. That's the thunderbird at the top. He appears quite frequently in a humorous way. And that's Daphne just looking at her own work and loving it. And this is, who I'm going to turn the microphone over to shortly, uh, Kelly. And Kelly comes in, and, and Kelly has her drawings out on the table for you to see. She'll tell you her story, but Kelly and Daphne look at each other's art, and they even have the same sketchbooks, as you'll notice, and have a wonderful time doing it and talking about it. These are the more recent drawings. That one is from last weekend. That one's from the, about not quite two weeks ago. That's from last weekend. And this is in the same time frame. Sorry, I'm just going to go back to that a bit. Daphne, this is where the um, theory that I was telling you about were the four colors repeated five times. And it, the weave of the line, she, she feels that her drawing's getting better. I said, well, you know, it's good to feel that way. At this, that, that's great. Um, but, she, but she's very um, fascinated by it. She said, you know, I think line was really always my strength. I have a wonderful sense of flow and curve to them. And she really, there's something about the line that speaks deeply to her and allows her to have that, that just that sense of awe, joy, self-satisfaction, you know, self and self-actualization. Now, this is the last, uh, the painting that's in the gallery, and that is Kelly's daughter. The painting is called, From Mother Earth Flows the River of Life. And I thought it was a beautiful way to end because Kelly will tell you the story of how, what, what art is doing for her and her children, and the interest in nature, and it's just a beautiful, I think, expression of everything that Daphne believes in. From Mother Earth does flow the river of life, and when we pay attention to it and draw it intimately as she does, we further the river of life, which she's doing at 95, and I think it's a beautiful thing. Thank you. So I think I'm the only person here that hasn't written anything down. So I'm a little nervous now that I'm the only one that hasn't written anything down, but I'm just going to speak completely from the heart. My name is Kelly Schoenfeld, and I work at Cottonwoods Care Home. I am a therapy assistant there. So my job is to have fun with the residents. That's what I do. I take them on outings. I get to know them. I get to know their families. And I love what I do. I didn't expect to 
be emotional. <laughs> but I should have known myself better than that by now. <laughs> so Daphne, I met, I believe the first time I met Daphne, she was painting with Carol. And Carol's my coworker, she's right over there. Um, they were in a, Carol was doing an art class and Daphne was telling her where to put the paint and where to put the colors. Um, <clears throat> so that was the first time I met her and then I just, there is a spirit about her that I'm, I'm just drawn to. It's like she's my kindred spirit. She inspires me in so many ways. I would go into her room and I'd knock on her door and I'd just, uh, don't cry. <laughs> I can't look at Carol anymore. Um, I just, I sit in her room and she'll say, oh, what are you working on this week? Show me your sketchbook. And at first, the first time I brought my sketchbook into her, let me tell you, I was nervous. I thought, oh my goodness, here's Daphne. I'm going to show her my book. I've never showed anybody my book. <laughs> but she looked at it and all, all, any word that comes out of her mouth is just, it is so wonderful. It comes from the heart. Just, just paint it, just draw it. So I would... I continue to go in, and then now what she says to me now is, when are you going to show it to a gallery? Come on, go, 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 go. <laughs> and I am still at that stage where, oh, I don't know if I should show anybody my work. <laughs> but I am getting braver, and Daphne does inspire me to put myself out there. Um, Another thing that she does for me is I feel that when I'm with her, there is a connection because I didn't have that connection to my heritage. She is that connection for me. Sorry. I could hold up some of Kelly's drawings just so you can see what she's gotten into since she started drawing. She had not really been drawing before this interaction with Daphne, and Kelly's mentioned that it reminded her what she hadn't learned from her grandfather, or the, and, and that part of her heritage, and it's just all sort of come together, and she's doing beautiful work. You can see why Daphne's saying, you need to take it into a gallery, you need to take it into a gallery. You have a gallery where, uh, owner standing just about down directly. <laughs> you don't know that, but I did. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> I didn't. She knows who she is. I know who she is. But that's all. This is a beautiful one, too. So one of the things, um, I, Daphne has met my children. I have a five-year-old son, and I have a three-year-old daughter. And my son, I was telling her that we went over to um, Turtle Island Gallery and I said we were looking at dream catchers. And I said, my son really, really would like a dream catcher. And I told her, I said, he picked the biggest one. I think it's huge. But he told me, he said, mommy, those catch the biggest dreams. And so Daphne had heard this, and I had left her room, and later that day, she came out with a dream catcher that was on her wall to give to my son. <laughs> she is very precious to me. She also, on the night of the gallery opening, I, um, I had gone in earlier with my daughter, and that was my favorite painting. I'd never really seen her paintings before, and so um, I went in, and the night of the gallery, I wanted to talk to Daphne about her painting. I said, if you have a second, come on over here. And so she came over with me, and I said, you see that right there? And I don't know if any of you do this, but when I'm in a, looking at somebody's work, I get right up to it, and I have to see how they do it how they do that, I want to learn how that, how do they do that? 
So I asked her, I said, you know that part right there? How'd you do that, Daphne? And I got right down beside her and I said, how did you do that? And she said, I used a kitchen fork. <laughs> <laughs> you used a what? <laughs> well, that was brilliant. <laughs> So she's just a wonderful, caring person. And just to tell you a little bit about that um, sailing trip, I took her on that sailing trip, and she, I don't think she realized when I went with her that it was gonna be just her in the boat. So she kept on saying over and over again, is it just me? Is it just me in the boat? I said, yes, it's just you. Are you sure? Oh yes, it's just you. You'll be fine. Have fun. And she came back and she was just had the biggest grin on her face. She had so much fun. So um, I think that's all I have to say. She's just a wonderful person and I feel very blessed. I go in and I see her. My, my week starts on a Thursday and I I work Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I see her every day. I go in on um, Thursday, I show her my work, and I say, this is what I'm working on. Friday, I go in again, and I say, okay, what are you working? What are you doing? Saturday night, first thing I have to do is break out the paints and break out the pens. Saturday night is my night to create, and after I've spoken to Daphne for three days, I just feel so inspired. She just tells me to paint from the heart, she tells me to follow my pencil, and if I say to her, well, how do you do that? Well, just follow your pencil. So, thank you. You can see that Daphne's having a great time in her 95th year, and still influencing people beautifully. It's, it's wonderful to see. But what both Kelly and I hope that you'll, you'll understand and when, thank you, uh, when Yvonne um, comes up, is that what Daphne most wants is to get everybody drawing, get everybody making art. And particularly as we move into middle age and on, it, it's the relaxing thing that we can do for ourselves now, and as, I, as we're trying to show, have right, right till your last days. And it's not making masterpieces, it's enjoying yourself. And it's a message that really needs to get out there. Um, I think just, and, and as I say to Daphne, just as in 1972, at the age of 53, when she created the, um, what's called the Indian, colloquially the Indian Group of Seven, the exhibition that you're seeing in the gallery, um, she did that because she wanted the, her people to have respect for themselves and get the recognition that she felt they deserved in this country. She did that. She got them into galleries for the first, and not just in craft shops, for the first time ever. But what she did for them was give them greater respect for themselves and greater purpose. She hopes that she's doing what might be, her story might do the same thing for everyone and for seniors in particular now. She's done it before. If I think we could all help her do it again. Um, you mind? If you, I'll, I'll bring this over to you or do you want to go up here? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter to me. I'll pass this to you. Yvonne um, is, she has her story too. I'll let her tell it. I'm not going to say any more than that. Go ahead. <laughs> I'd be happier if you would tell my story. I'm a terrible public speaker, which unlike uh, Kelly, I wrote everything down because I know I'll freeze. So I'm Yvonne. Um, my story is a lot different than Kelly's. I do work at Cottonwoods as well. I'm a housekeeper, and that's how I met Daphne. Um, but uh, I wanted to start by telling you a little about myself. Like Daphne, I also have a Native background. My mother is an elder with the Kamloops Indian Band and had worked for the Band Council in housing and education for many years. But she didn't get involved in this work until all of us children children had grown up and moved away. So I didn't have the exposure to Native culture like Daphne did. Um, but I always felt something was missing in my life. I knew there was something there that I needed. So I went on and I studied fine arts at um, UBC back when it was Okanagan University College. I'm a little old. 
And uh, I studied, um, in my third and fourth year, I studied Native Arts, Okanagan Native Culture. And um, actually I studied Okanagan Native Studies and, see, I knew I'd screw this up. <laughs> okay, Okanagan Native, Native Studies and Canadian Art History. That's what I'm trying to say. While I was studying Canadian art history, it surprised me that we, we studied the traditional group of seven, but there was no mention of native arts at all, almost none, maybe the odd mention of totem poles. And so I started to have this hunger like to find more art that was closer to my heart. And that's when I did my own studying, my own research, and I started going from gallery to gallery in Kelowna looking for any native arts. Even when I was studying Okanagan native culture, I discovered that there wasn't much art in the studies. There was almost no, there was basket weaving and you know stuff like that, but no real art. So uh, one of the galleries I went to was the Hamilton Gallery, and that's when I first discovered Daphne's art. And I stood in front of her art and it spoke to me. It's like I recognized my own self in her artworks. It was awe-inspiring. But I had no idea who this person was. So I went home and I did some Googling and I found Daphne online. And I fell in love with everything I saw, not just the pieces of her art, but who she was as a person and how much she changed the art world for Native artists. Everything about her just mesmerized me. So, um, after that, um, okay, I'm gonna have to just ad-lib this. You did way better than I'm doing. <laughs> I can't read. <laughs> I'm just gonna ad-lib. Okay, so, I did all that, discovered Daphne, fell in love with her, and as I've got a few of my works here, I have prints of paintings that I had done. They're actually quite large works, they're oil on canvas. But these prints that I brought were a direct influence from the Hamilton Art Gallery and my research of Daphne's work absolutely influenced the works that I did here. And um, for about 10, that, those were made about 10 years ago. And uh, since then, I stopped making art. I just <clears throat> became overwhelmed, I think, academically. The, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, the, when you go to art school, there's all this pressure to be the artist and all this expectation put on you. And I started to freeze up and I thought, you know what, I, I don't think I am an artist. I can't make great works of art. Like, I can't do, do this, I can't be this person. And so I stopped, I completely stopped. And um, it wasn't until I, I started working at Cottonwoods, and that is quite the story. I got the job at Cottonwoods, and I, I'm a housekeeper, and I was working down the hallway Daphne lives in. And I, going along, and I see one of her prints on the walls, and I thought, wow, that's gorgeous, I love that one. You know, thank God they have some decent art here for these people. <laughs> you know? So I'm standing there staring at it, and I can hear this, this soft whistling inside the room that I have to go clean. So I go into the room, and, and then I see a, another print of Daphne's on, on the wall in the room, but there's a curtain there, right? And I'm like, holy cow, someone likes Daphne Ajay. Like, this is my favorite artist. So I sneak in, and I hear this whistling, and I peer around the curtain, and I'm like, oh my God. I step back, I'm like, this can't be real. Like, I come back and it's like, that's Daphne Oche. She's here where I'm working. And she's sitting in her bed, and she's totally oblivious that I'm there. She has no idea I'm even there. So anyway, I'm looking, and she's whistling, and she's drawing. So I, I like tap on the wall, knock, knock. I'm like, excuse me, she looks up. Hello, and I'm like, you're Daphne Ojig. <laughs> and she's like, yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, oh my God, I'm the housekeeper. And she's just looking at me like I'm crazy. 
And I said, I absolutely love you. I just melted all over her. I love your work. I love your work. What are you doing? And I'm almost on her lap staring at her drawings. And I'm looking at, she's got other drawings on the table. And I'm looking all around the room. I'm completely mesmerized by her. So I tell her a little about myself and that I, you know, I, I love your work. I have done some paintings, you know, inspired by your work. You're one of my heroes. It was like meeting my rock star. So uh, I told her about myself. We looked through her work, and it, I'm, it's a working day, so we had to have a little short chit-chat, and away I went. And I went home, and I told my family and anyone that within earshot, I met Daphne Ochig. She's at my work. Oh, my God. My husband here, he knows. I was literally jumping up and down. Oh my god, I met Daphne Hodge. So anyway, I, I um, went back to work on, and I spoke to her again. But anyway, on a day off, that's when I met Karen. I took a day off and I went to see Daphne. I brought a sketchbook, pencils, everything, and I begged her, can I do a portrait of you? So she said, sure, why not, you know? And um, at the same time, I showed her pictures on my phone of just my prints, and she loved my work. She said it was beautiful. And anyway, while I'm talking to her, asking her if I could do a portrait of her and showing her some of my work, in walks Karen. And she literally bumped right into me, and I'm like, oh, hi, I'm, I'm Yvonne. <laughs> I want to do a portrait of Daphne. So anyway, that's how we met, and that's how I came here to talk to you guys today, um, just because I love Daphne Ajig, obviously everyone in the room does as well. I am incredibly inspired by her work. I think she's the most amazing senior artist that I have ever met personally. And how she inspires me most is not only by her original works, which inspired me first, but by her later works, how she makes art despite all odds, like the arthritis in her hands, to, to watch her make art, it just, it melts your heart. It just is so inspiring. If she can do it, anyone can do it. And that's what she has taught me, just like Kelly said. That's one thing Daphne said to me too when I told her I, I haven't done art in, in almost 10 years. She said, well, just get a pencil and put it down and get to it. And I said, well, okay, I think I will. <laughs> and then I did. I went home and I started making portraits, which is something I'd never done before. But I don't know, just you never know where inspiration is going to come. And Daphne is one of the biggest inspirations that have been in my artistic career. And I owe, I owe her so much gratitude and love. I don't know what else Thanks. to say. <laughs> For any of you that might decide to visit, outside her door is Daphne Beaven, which was her the, her husband's name, and that's the way you're labeled at Cottonwoods by whatever your most recent. There is no respect for the name that um, what you what your own wishes are. But in any case, what I did want to say is that it's quite nice that these posters they were sent by Daphne's dealer in Toronto for her 94th birthday. And um, it's great because she's got all kinds of things in her room and they've been very, very nice about letting her really decorate and have it like home. Stanley, her son, even brought in the two stools that he had in, her in his um, store with the picture, her pictures on the seats and she's got those in there too. It's getting quite nice. Jordan um, is an example of a young man who also was inspired by Daphne's work and I, and I think it speaks to what she's been in that she is an example of someone who has succeeded, had, who's made a life as an artist and stayed so incredibly human as you can tell, that that in itself is an inspiration for other young people. Thank you. Jordan Bennett. Thank you. Um, yay Daphne. Um, so I moved to Kelowna from Newfoundland with uh, myself and my wife, uh, Amy. We moved here in August. One of my first jobs as a teaching assistant here at, at uh, um, UBC Okanagan, uh, my supervisor uh, emailed me. He's like, hey, uh, Daphne Ojig 
needs help Skyping to a gallery opening in Toronto. Do you want to do it? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> of course I do. So I, I was contacted by my advisor, Stephen Foster, uh, who was in uh, contact with you. And uh, the stars aligned, and I came down one day um, to help Daphne Skype in. Uh, well, we did a practice run, so I'm going to show you the practice run first. So I, I walked in, and I'm nervous. It's my first time in a senior's home in a long time. Um, I was very close to my grandma. Like, my grandma was my best friend. And I lost my grandma a couple years ago. So walking into the seniors complex um, really brought back a lot of memories and uh, emotions. And then when I saw Daphne, I was like, this is amazing. This is like being with my grandma yet again um, in a different form. So I walked in and I met Karen and I met Daphne and uh, I was wearing my turquoise on my neck. And um, I, when, you know, whenever I'm nervous or when I travel, I wear my turquoise. And then Daphne had on an amazing array of turquoise, like so much turquoise. So she spotted that and she was like, oh, you have your turquoise on. I'm like, yeah, I said, you know, it really makes me feel grounded. And she asked me where I was from, so really interested. And I was like, this lady is sharp. She cannot be 95 years old. This is amazing. So we started talking and I told her I was Mi'kmaq from Newfoundland. And she was so happy to meet a Mi'kmaq person from Newfoundland. So we started chatting and uh, we were getting ready to do this interview. And she said, so what are we going to do here? I said, we're going to go on the computer and we're going to talk to your friend, Philip Gevick in Toronto. I said, we're going to do like, you know, show you the show. We're going to do a test. She's like, what do you mean? How, what do you mean? I'm going to see Philip on either side. I'm like, yeah, we're going to do through a computer. She's like, this is like time travel. <laughs> so I was like, kind of is like time travel. I was thinking, I was like, this woman has seen a lot over the course of her life. Technologies have changed so drastically. And now we're sitting in Cottonwoods in Kelowna, getting ready to do a gallery opening in Toronto. So I get there, and this is the day of the actual uh, get-together. She wore a tiara. Karen brought it. She loved it. Um, and she had her mouthpiece here. But I said, yeah. Was, she was like, I'm not putting that on my head. And then probably four minutes before we started, she's like, okay, I'll wear it. But the first day we got there, we were going through all these, we were doing a walk around, because Philip wanted to show all of our artworks that were in the show. So it was amazing because uh, it was the three of us there, and, and Daphne started seeing these artworks that she hasn't seen since she created them, a lot of them. She, one that she's seen there, she hadn't seen since the 19, late 1960s. Yeah. So we were walking around, and this is where she started to, like she was like, this is like a time machine, this is unbelievable. Um, so we were going around, she was explaining all these pieces, and she was so nervous before she did that, but she looked at me, and she's like, well, she said, I'm gonna, I'll be all right. She's like, because I got my turquoise, and she grabbed my arm, she's like, and I got my Mi'kmaq. <laughs> so I, and that's why my face is just glaring, and I was like, this is unbelievable. So we're doing this walk around the gallery, and I started thinking about how significant this moment was. She's 95 years old, she's having a show in Toronto. She's not only having a show in Toronto, she was, one, she was the person who paved the way for Indigenous artists to be able to show in galleries. So I'm sitting here with Daphne, realizing that the people that inspired me are the generation between my generation and her generation. So it's this generational thing that's going on where a lot of my idols, Daphne's always been a huge inspiration for me, but the people that directly impacted me that I got to meet were the people that she met when they were my age. So here I was sitting with Daphne going over all these paintings and just being absolutely floored by what was going on. And I got pretty funny, especially when we got to this piece. Remember this one? This was the Tales from the Smokehouse. I'm going to have a little parental advisory. There's no kids here, I know, but it's pretty funny. So she looked at me, she grabbed me by the arm again. She's like, you see this one? I'm like, yeah, she's like, this one's erotic. I was like, oh yeah? She said, do you see that woman? I was like, yeah. She's like, you know what she's holding? I was like, what? She's like, she's holding a bag of penises. <laughs> and she just laughed and laughed and laughed. And then she told us the story of why she came up with this series, and she loves talking about the Tales from the Smokehouse. So that blew me away. It was great. Um, and then I think this is the piece that she hadn't seen in a long time. And uh, so going through this show with her sitting next to her was just a very unique time. Um, 
I remember actually this piece, when I was seeing this piece, I, I realized, well I knew, but it really struck me that these were the images that were on the Canada Post stamps, you know what I mean? Like, and I was like, and I was looking to my right, I'm like, this is unbelievable. <laughs> so we went through all our paintings, it was great, and I'm going to show you the last one. We were, before we did our, our uh, meeting, and before we did our test, um, she was trying to come up with a strategy, because this is the first time she's ever done Skype. And so Karen had gave her this mouthpiece, so whenever she got nervous, she would blow on it. Or if she didn't want to answer a question, she would blow on it. So, amazing day, amazing time to meet uh, Daphne, and I'm so happy that you asked me to come speak, and you guys did an absolutely amazing job. Your stories really struck me as well, because Daphne is quite the inspiration. Um, an elder to us all, but a, a trailblazer for the art world, the entire Canadian art world. So thank you for listening to my time with Daphne. Thank you, Jordan. Um, do any of you have any questions for us? How was it that she managed to get such influence? Like, why didn't anyone listen to it? Well, uh, I think even Daphne would agree. She was at the right time in history. I think that she probably, that's part of that, that self-actualization that I was talking about. Um, to be honest, you probably have heard um, her talk about Dr. Maybe, do you know this? Anyway, Dr. Schwartz um, was an uh, anthropologist, and he is the one who commissioned Tales from the Smokehouse. And that is, he was a, a wealthy man from Montreal, a doctor, and he, I, I, a bit of an adventurer, a bit of a, and he, he had a good life, a probably very much a Renaissance man. And he saw some of Daphne's work, and he also had friend, a friendship with um, uh, Jacqueline Castle, uh, former, or the last wife of the castle. And so that is where that association has come in many people's minds, that Picasso saw, and, and you know, as Canadians, we like that. And he did see her work in that, but that's how it happened. And um, this, then uh, Schwartz asked her to do these tales from the smokehouse, and so she tells the story regularly, that if any, it, as Jordan said, she really wanted to tell it on her 95th birthday. <laughs> The other, the people, she was so cool on Skype that she practically stunned the people in the room. It was Toronto and everybody was being in, but there was, you know, Dennis Reed was there from, who had been the founder of the part of Canadian Art Gallery and they were sort of all taken aback. But to go back to that she was so spry and so willing to joke, but in any ways to go back to, I, I think that she would agree that Dr. Schwartz gave her a little bit of a leg up by publicizing. And the tales from the smokehouse, he would, these were tales that the natives told themselves of the men in the smokehouse. And they were erotic. And they, the book is, it's still available, you can get it online. Um, and she did these drawings, and the show was closed. The first, it was, the RCMP closed it down the first opening up. <laughs> this was again, you know, there's no such thing as bad press. And then it became, her timing, it, it was just all good. 1972, she and her husband, who worked, this was her second husband, Daphne um, mar married a man who came out to, um, Vancouver and she was set up as she said with a man that her friends thought that she would like to marry and she did Paul Summerfield and um, then he was killed in a car accident and Stan was about eight years old and Daphne was left to run the strawberry farm and she quickly realized she needed other help and she married Chester Beeman and um, he worked with Northern Affairs and he was very interested in her art and supporting it and so they he, that gave them a a government connection and right people, right times. I don't think saying that takes anything away from her work, but I think it's right to ask that, you know, from, from her reputation, right? It's just she was, she's lived an enchanted life in many ways, and she's the first one to say that. And she's very fun. So that has made people along the way want to help her more and more. She makes everybody that comes up with an idea of something to do, and she was 
been invited to Israel to um, do paintings for the airlines. Again, Philip tells, because and she and Dr. Schwartz went together, and um, she was a great party girl. <laughs> and it all worked out very well. People liked it. Anybody else? I think we're very lucky. This will be Daphne's last residence, I quite imagine. And aren't we lucky? And I think it's wonderful for the gallery to give us this opportunity tonight. Thank you, Brenda, for making you more aware of what a treasure we have living within our community. And, um, and that she's open to anyone who would like to come and visit her. And I, I feel as I've been on this beat for about a year and a half now, have to rally for it. Um, we're very lucky to have her here. Now, what can we do to make it, um, what to make her last days wonderful? Now, having said that, when she got moved into the private room, it's number 100. And I said, well, that settles it. You're around 100. She said, you know, I think so. <laughs> so, let's um, give, gives us five years to see what more she can teach us. Thank you all very much.